Good morning and welcome to worship with First United Methodist Church here in Brownwood, Texas. I'm so thankful that you have chosen to tune in today to worship together as we celebrate our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to welcome those of you right here in Brownwood, Texas, as well as those who are tuning in from all over the nation. Uh, it is a joy to worship with you today. In a few moments, you'll have the opportunity to hear from Pastor Joey uh, what God has laid on his heart for you on this day. Uh, but before we get to that, I wanted to cover a couple of details. Uh, and, and first of all, I want to say thank you for your generosity. In the middle of this, our second shutdown, you continue to be generous. Thank you for trusting us with your tithes and your offerings as we seek to be the body of Christ, reaching others, helping others to know, love, and serve Jesus. Uh, it is uh, it's so important that we continue the ministry of our church in this community and beyond. So thank you for your generosity. I also wanted to tell you that as of today, we are still on track uh, to begin face-to-face -face worship this coming Sunday, the first Sunday in August. Uh, be watching your email uh, for any changes that may come. Of course, this is a fluid situation as we deal with the pandemic and the outbreak and the increasing cases that continue to happen throughout our state and nation. Before we turn our attention to Joey's message, I wanted to share a scripture that is on my heart this week. It comes to us from Luke chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. The Pharisees asked Jesus when God's kingdom was coming. And he replied, God's kingdom isn't coming with signs and that are easily noticed. Nor will people say, look, here it is, or there it is. Don't you see, God's kingdom is already among you. In the midst of of this pandemic, in the midst of all that is going on, or maybe I should say in spite of all that is going on in our nation right now, God's kingdom is in our midst. We are living in the midst of God's kingdom. We profess that truth every time we share in the Lord's Prayer. So today, I'd like to take just a moment to pray for you, to pray for Joey, and for us to share together in the Lord's Prayer as we remember that God's kingdom is here already in the midst of or in spite of all that is going on. So will you pray with me? Holy God, thank you for this day that we have been given, this day that we have that we can proclaim your message of hope. Though we can share together in the, the breaking open of your word. So God, would you pour your message into Joey as he delivers your message to your people. And God, would you fill each of us with your grace, your peace, and your presence. In the midst of these times where we struggle with what it means and how it is that we live in the middle of this pandemic. Lord, I pray for those who have been sick, those who continue to recover, those who are struggling with this illness. I pray and lift up our small business owners to you who are struggling at this time just to, to keep their businesses open. God, I pray that you would continue to work in and through this community of faith as we reach out to the community at large, sharing your love and grace with them, helping others to know you and love you and serve you. And Lord, as you taught us to pray, now we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. 
Amen. And now, sit back and relax as Pastor Joey brings God's message. Well, good morning. It's so good to have you with us on this online service today and hope it'll be a blessing to you. My message today comes from Jeremiah chapter 18, and it's a story in which God asks the prophet Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house. And he does. He goes down there and he observes the potter making something on his wheel. And out of that, uh, the Lord speaks to him in a very specific way. So what I want to do today is I want to read that passage from Jeremiah 18, 1 through 6. And then I'm going to follow that up with showing you a short compilation of modern day potters making things on the pottery wheel because I want that image to be in your mind as we go through the message today. So here's our scripture from Jeremiah 18. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. And then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Then as the clay is as in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Now take a look at this compilation. Get this image in your mind of what it means to shape something on the potter's wheel. Right. And so with those images in our mind, I want you to be considering what the Lord is saying to us through this incredible story. It's a very unique story, I think, uh, an experience in the life of the prophet Jeremiah. Part of the work of God is to shape the lives of His people. He is, I believe, at all times looking to work into our lives certain traits and characteristics that reflect His nature. Our lives are to reflect the character of God. It has always been that way with his people. Since he first called Abram to form a relationship, a covenant with people, and, and he talked about how there'll be a light to the nations and, and, and that through them, the, the world would know who God was. And it's kind of the same thing with us in a very real sense. But God's always trying to work those characteristics of who he is, like the potter works into the clay, those traits that he wants most in us, grace and kindness, mercy, justice, boldness and courage a deep love for others. And one of the things I want to point out from the very beginning is this, is that I don't believe that these traits just get molded into our lives automatically. It's not like we got in line in the elementary cafeteria when we were in second grade and they just handed these out to everybody in line. These are things that have to be developed in our lives. Uh, we can't just put it on cruise control and expect them to be working. And that's why God gives us this image of, of, of potter. And when we sing those songs, a lot of songs that say this, that He is the potter and we are the clay. And, and, and I want to show today some reasons why that's really good news and why it should bring some comfort to us. Uh, someone told me this story a long time ago, and I can't authenticate it, and so it may be a folklore. Uh, but they told it to me as if it was something that actually happened. But a group of African men flew in from an African country to one of our large cities. And because they were such a large group, they rented a 15-passenger van. One of the guys had some experience driving. Everybody else pretty much had not had you know, much interaction with any kind of mechanical or technological things. And so the one driver got there, and they got outside the city, and they were going down the highway. And he looks down and sees that it says cruise control. So he sets it on cruise control, and then he turns around and walks to the back of the van to visit and hang out with his friends. And of course, the van crashes. He thought in his mind that cruise control on a van was like autopilot on an airplane. 
Let me just say this. The, the things that need to be worked into our lives aren't things that come when we're just on cruise control. In fact, God Himself is the one setting the agenda, putting His hands on us, and shaping and molding us and working those things in our lives. And I would say, just like these guys in the van, if we put it on cruise control and we don't participate with God to, to see these things happen, our lives too would be a wreck without God shaping us. So these deeper attributes of the heart, these, these things that really sh that shape our souls are things that have to be worked into our lives. You know, when we're little kids, no one has to teach us certain things. I'm always amazed at little toddlers that their mama did not have to pull them aside and say, listen, when you get your favorite toy and your cousin comes to take it from you, I want you to hold it close to yourself in, in your chest and just say, mine. It's mine. Nobody has to teach a, a, a little child to say mine. There's certain things that, that come naturally. But the things that I'm talking about as, as a child of God are things that aren't just going to come to us like on a conveyor belt in a factory. We come to Jesus, we get baptized, we start participating in small groups, we start attending worship. All of these things help to shape and grow us spiritually. But I think the deeper development, the real intimate, really deep things of our heart is the kind of growth that only comes when God puts His hands on our heart and begins to shape us. And they do not occur, occur in the natural rhythms of life. All the time, God has to kind of take us aside, like He took Jeremiah aside and said, observe this thing. But let's make sure that we know this for sure and nail this down. God is active in shaping the hearts and lives of His people. He does not do this passively. He identifies the areas in which we have flaws and imperfections, areas where we're still selfish or immature. And He begins to squeeze us and carve us and mold us and cut things away like you saw those potters do and make us into a vessel so that we are more capable of completely carrying out His purpose in our lives. It is a great grace that in this way we cannot get away with things. Uh, others can be fooled, but God cannot be fooled. Uh, you know, I think sometimes we can come to church and we can put on, you know, our spiritual expressions and face and attitude. And we can hold that together for a couple hours. But if somebody was living with us 24-7, they're going to see our humanity and, it, and our imperfections. And, and it's okay that it's that way. I want you to notice this. It's interesting that in verse 4 it says that the vessel that, was, that it was made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter. What's interesting to me is, that, is, is it's not that we're detached from God and because of that we have imperfections that need to be reshaped and remolded. It's even while we're in God's hands, while we're in the hand of the potter, we can become marred or flawed or imperfect. But God is not surprised by this. God's never surprised when someone who is godly, who loves Him, who leads Bible studies, who gives alms to the poor, who does everything you know, that a person should do, that even in their lives as a saint, everybody has to say a saint, there's a flaw that will sometimes come to the surface. And God is able to, to deal with that. His picture here is that He calls us to a higher standard, that He's always going to work on things. So we need to remember this, that God alone sees the fullness of what we can be. He really sees it in your life. He doesn't see just where you've been, where you grew up, how you are now. He, he sees the trajectory of your life and He sees the fullness of what you can be. And so because of that, He alone at times will insist that each of us face the imperfections that are there in our lives because He knows that although the wart that is there now is not too bothersome in this current situation. He knows that later on down the road as He grows you and develops you and gives you more responsibility and puts you in other situations, that it can then become an impediment to something that He wants to do in the future. Yeah, we can get away with it sometimes at church, just sort of the appearance, but God sometimes will come and put His hand on us and, and insist that he allow us, we allow Him to mold us and shape us. Uh, when I was in college, there, there was a, a little church that I attended, and there was a, a pastor who had preached in Brownwood in one of the larger churches for several years, and he had moved on somewhere else. And my pastor invited him back to speak, and I remember him standing and telling the story. He said, you know, he would, he would go to the church office, and, and, and people loved him. He was a great pastor. They're like, oh, we love you. And they're like, oh, the pastor, the pastor, that's the holy man of God. It was kind of that 
sort of way of being treated. And, and then he would go home, and, and his wife, you know, knew the full extent of who he was. And, and one day he was home for lunch, and she chose to address something of, of one of those flaws in his life, and she wasn't going to let him get away with it. That's, that's part of what wives do, right, guys? By the way, it's what husbands can do also. But anyway, so he goes home, and, and, and she just absolutely insists, even on his lunch break, that he's going to deal with this and talk about it. And he finally just got so frustrated, he just got up and said, I'm going back to the office. And he storms out the door, and he's going down the driveway to get in the car, and she flings open the door on the porch, and she says, go ahead. Go ahead and go back down there to that church where everybody thinks you're perfect. I know better. Well, listen, God knows better. God knows that we're not perfect. But here's the great grace of that. He is willing to continually work to shape into us and to, to polish out those imperfections, to reshape the clay, to mold in us things that we could never acquire on our own of grace and love and goodness and peace and justice and mercy, all of those traits. So how do we look at this? I want to, I want to break down the manner in which the, the context of the story occurs and kind of the, the, the facets of, of how this story is spoken in the life of Jeremiah. Number one, you should know this. Jeremiah knew when God was speaking to him. He knew God's voice. Now, we, we know prophets, of course. That, that's how they're prophets. They know the voice of God. But listen, we're called to be the same. You know, we, we also are, need to be people who, who know God's voice. I remember a day in my life when someone would say something like this. The other day I was praying and God spoke to me, blah, blah, blah. Or the other day I was driving down the road and I was thinking about something and then the Lord spoke to me. He gave me a word. And I remember there was a time in my life I used to thought, those people are weirdos. Those people are out of touch. I, you know, how, how do you know th this kind of thing? What, what, what is the deal with that? Well, now I think I'm, I'm on the other side. Now I know people who go to church all the time who read their Bible all the time, who go to small groups, who go to worship, who are very faithful. And I never hear them saying, you know what? The other day the Lord spoke to me. Today I was praying and I felt like God said to me. That ought to be more the norm uh, than the other thing. Now, I, I'm like you. I don't like it done when it's flaky. You know, I don't mean any disrespect here. Hope you know that. But like the person that says they're going down the cereal aisle and God told them they should buy the Brookshire's brand instead of the regular brand. Of, uh, of, you know, Raisin Bran. See, it, it, you, you, get into, you can get into some people that talk about it too much and in a flaky sort of way. But people who are solid, who love the Lord, who are walking with Him, who are seeking to know Him and the fullness of His purpose for their lives are people who should know and recognize it when the Lord speaks to them. So, a long time ago, this is... 30 years ago, I was in uh, a difficult situation and I was upset and I was, I was crying, I was hurting. And a friend of mine was there and, and she was praying for me. And she said, I want to pray for you. So she stood up and she put her hand on my shoulder and just started praying. And in the middle of that prayer, she stopped. And, uh, and she said, I think the Lord is saying something to you about that story about the potter. And she said, let me go find my Bible. And so she went and, she, and it was this story. And what God was saying was, this pain that you're going through right now is a part of me shaping your life. It ought to bring us great comfort that in the midst of our most stressful situations, most heartbroken situations, that we have a Father who is using that and all other situations to mold us and shape us into the people that He really wants us to be. But I want to just say this. Jeremiah knew the voice of the Lord, and God's people also should be familiar with God's voice. What are some ways that God speaks to us. Let me remind you of, of, of a few things I want you to be thinking about. And I, wanted to, I, I would want it to be a goal for all of us in this season to say, I want to become more clear about what I know when I hear the voice of the Lord. So for example, one of the ways the Lord speaks to me is, through, is in the area of peace. So it's not really a voice, it's more like a sense in my gut or a feeling. So for example, I might make a decision and I start working towards that decision, taking steps, moving, and in the middle of it, I have a lack of peace. So a lack of peace is God's voice to me. And sometimes that's the way I know. I'm like, I, I just, I'm not going to do this because the more I walk towards it, 
the less peace I have. That's an example. Or the other example can be true. You're walking towards something and it's a little scary, it's a little crazy, but you know you're supposed to do it, you felt led to do it, and as you walk toward it, you, you just feel more and more peace. So the absence of or the presence of peace is the voice of God. I know a lot of people that, that the Lord speaks to them in dreams. They'll wake up with a dream and it means something. And it's, it's not something I typically do, but, but I know people that do. And, and then sometimes it may just be that a scripture will really jump out at you. So as we, as we look at this passage of how Jeremiah heard the voice of the Lord, I, I want to emphasize kind of the anatomy of the manner in which he heard the voice of the Lord. And so here's this phrase. I want you to hear this phrase, and it should echo in our spirits. He said this, And the word of the Lord came to me. When he got down to the potter's house, he, he was waiting as, as God instructed, watching the potter do his thing. And then in, in the midst of that, it said this, And the word of the Lord came to me. Now listen, that phrase, the word of the Lord, occurs all throughout Scripture, particularly in the Old Testament. It is prevalent in Scripture. Let me give you just a thumbnail sketch. Genesis 15, when God calls Abram to become later Abraham, it says this, And the word of the Lord came to Abram. Our very faith was founded on not on a written book of Scripture, not on tradition and rituals, but our very faith, the father of our faith, started his journey when the word of the Lord came to him. Ezekiel 16, 1, and the word of the Lord came to me. 1 Samuel 15, 10, then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. Joel 1, 1, and the word of the Lord came to Joel. 2 Samuel 7, 4, but it happened that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Zechariah 1, 1, and in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah. The word of the Lord came to them, and I believe the word of the Lord still comes to us. So we need to know and recognize and pray about what that is for each of us, what that means to recognize when the Word of the Lord comes to us. Secondly, I want you to notice that in this anatomy of the way the Lord spoke to him, that when he came to him, he gave him a directive. The directive was, go down to the potter's house and stay there. So let me give you a deep, sophisticated, theological formula for spiritual success. If the Lord tells you to do something, you should do it. You shouldn't hesitate. If he says to you, go check on the widow next door and give her $200, you should write the check and go over there and give it to her. If the Lord says you should call somebody, uh, you should be worried about them, and you're like, well, he's fine or she's fine, you should pick up the phone. You should call. If, if, if any way that the Lord directs you, then, then your spiritual responsibility is not to understand it all, but to do it all. So do it. Go down to the potter's house, and that's exactly what he did. He went down to the potter's house. doesn't say he thought about it, contemplated it, ran it past three friends, read a commentary to see if it was correct theologically. No. He, the Word of the Lord came to him, he got a directive, and he went down to the potter's house and stood there. And because of that, he received a powerful word and was blessed. And then thirdly, the anatomy of this word is, is this. It was a very visual experience. It was a very visual experience. Listen, if the Lord tells you to go somewhere or speak to someone or do something or be somewhere, when you're there, one of the ways that He might very well speak to you is visually. So pay attention. Look around. Observe. Take in what's happening. Uh, Pay attention to what you see. Sometimes what you see is how God is speaking to you. So how did Jeremiah get to hear the full word of the Lord? He followed the directive. He carefully observed, and he was very visual with what he did. I want to remind you today, one of the teachings of Jesus is this, Matthew 4, 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord, that's how that we live. And so, you know, a question for all of us in this corona season when there's all the media reports and all the, like, is school going to open? What's going to happen? What about my income? What about my business? What about church? I mean, it's disrupted all of us. Let me tell you the, the question I have is, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord. My question for all of us is this, what are you living on? Where are you getting your bread from? I bet for all of us, we easily can leave some bread on the table if we're not careful. But we need to live on the, the bread of the Word of the Lord. Okay, the second point is this, and, and, and it goes like this. God will deal with the imperfections. Now, that, that doesn't sound pleasant. 
God will not allow people that obediently follow Him and seek maturity to just live forever with imperfections and flaws and weaknesses that need to be addressed. Uh, and, and again, we say this, that the, that, the, that the vessel that was in the hand of the Lord was marred. It was, it was marred in the hands of the potter, and He made it again into another vessel. Years ago, I was in a church. Again, it was in Brownwood, and uh, there was a guest speaker. And at one point, uh, the guest speaker... Uh, preached for a little while, then he stood up. And this may not have been your experience. I know many people who've had this kind of experience, but this guy had a, a prophetic gift. And so he got up and he just went around uh, and he asked different people to stand up and come forward and that kind of thing. And, and he called me out and, and he stood up. And, and, and I have this all written down and uh, I read it from time to time. And, and I just, it's just a reminder that the Lord knows my life. I mean, he, he, what, what the guy said was exactly right. From childhood through calling to ministry to what my current situation was, he walked it through, and everything he said, as, as he's saying it, I just know uh, the only way he knows this is that the Lord has revealed this to him. And one of the things he said to me was this, and I, and I quote it from my notes, all of the years of stripping and breaking and shaping and molding. You know, I found comfort in that. It doesn't sound like comfort, right? Stripping, breaking, shaping, molding, you know. But, but, but when he said it, I knew exactly what he was talking about. I could look back at the experiences of my life that were difficult and that God used them to shape and mold and break and, 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 and mold me into the person that he has to be. I, I say all of that to say this. We need to have more faith in the potter. Some of us get too worked up about the flaws we see in our lives and we get to feeling all guilty and we need to trust that God's going to deal with them and change it and mold it and redo it whenever He needs to. And some of us get way too worked up about the flaws that we see in other people. Sometimes in God's people. Sometimes somebody we go to Sunday school with. We just get all worked up about the flaws that are in their lives. And what we need to remember is that the potter is at work remolding and shaping each of us. There are a lot of metaphors for God. He's shepherd, He's father, He's deliverer, He's our rock, He's our fortress, He's alpha and omega, beginning and the end. But this image of Him being the potter is a metaphor that speaks to me because of all these things that have happened in my lives. Isaiah 29, 16, and by the way, you should know it's not just here in Jeremiah. So Isaiah 29, 16 says this, You turn things upside down as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. So shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me this way? And can the potter, can the pot say to the potter, you don't know anything? Isaiah 45, what sorrow awaits those who argue with their creator? Does a clay pot argue with its maker? Does the clay dispute with the one who shapes it saying, stop doing it, you're doing it wrong? <laughs> and then Romans 9, the apostle Paul gets in on the action. But you... But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, Why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? This idea of God being the potter is, is, is sprinkled throughout Scripture. So we need to remember this. God is very intentional in the way that He shapes His servants and this shaping, when we know the potter has put, his, put us on the wheel, is in those areas of our lives that we may not be aware of or we may want to ignore, but God does not miss them. The potter sees our flaws. He sees our imperfections. And in His great grace, He comes to those parts of our lives to carve it away, to smooth it over, to reshape it and mold us. We have to have more faith in the potter. And this is where we would trust the potter more that He can fully deal with the flaws both in our lives and in others' lives, and that He does it with great grace. Now, there are two things, I think, in this scenario that we underestimate. How intent God is on shaping us and how deeply we are in need of being shaped. There are all kinds of forces that try to shape us, our family background, our culture, pressures at work, all of those kinds of things. But the great truth of it is the greatest shaping of the deepest part of our lives as believers in relationship with God is His hand coming and shaping us and molding us and reworking us and making our lives be more like Him. Commentators tell us that what is depicted here, this picture of what Jeremiah writes about with the potter having the clay marred in his hands and he puts it back on the wheel and reshapes it and makes it, that this was very accurate to the time period. There were houses where different potters, like lots of potters, would come and 
work and make vessels. So uh, when I found this quote, I, I really like this quote. It says this, when a vessel was ruined in that day, the potter did not throw it away, but he crushed it together, dashed it back on the wheel, and began to work afresh to make something new. Now check it out. When the potter saw that there was a flaw, he did not throw the clay away and go get new clay. This is not a throwaway society. God, God doesn't participate in a throwaway society, especially when it comes to His people. He takes that which is marred and imperfect, and He puts it back on the wheel, see, to make it away. Sometimes we have to come face to face with the harsh realities of our flaws and imperfections, but we have to remember God's not going to throw us away. Sometimes I've known people in church that feel so guilty about their flaws and imperfections, their past mistakes, you know, all the different things that they faced, and, and, and they almost wish God would throw them away. It would be easier. They're like, they're being tortured. But I just come today to say that perhaps the shift in mindset here is to really see the grace of God displayed in the life of the potter. Your flaws, your imperfections don't scare God. He's not afraid of your mistakes. He's not overwhelmed by your past. He's not overwhelmed by your your, your selfishness or your temper or whatever it is that, that you hide away from others, God's not afraid of it. In fact, He is intent on one day putting His hand on it and working it out to smooth that area of your life. I love that old commercial series, the campaign was, Got Milk? How about this one? Maybe we can make a t-shirt. Got flaws? Feel beat up? Feel unworthy? then we say to you today, you have come to the right place. God does not give up on us. He does not throw us away. He doesn't look at it and go, well, they made a mistake and now they're imperfect, so I'm just going to throw them away, put somebody else in their place. No, no, no. He keeps on working out those things in our lives that probably would drive us crazy if we did not believe that He had His hand on us. He will not discard you over a flaw, over a mistake, over an imperfection. He embraces you in every way. So what are our takeaways today? God is speaking. And we as His people need to continually work towards learning to recognize His voice better and better. God is actively shaping His people. He's not complacent. He's not, uh, he's not just sitting back and watching. He's not completely inactive. God is busy at work shaping the lives of His people. And then this one, the Father does not discard people if they have flaws. In fact, for Him, He loves them more because they become then His greatest work. Let us pray together. So glad that you're here today. Let me pray us out. Father, teach us to recognize Your voice. Thank You for being active in our lives, for, for continuing to work, even in areas where we've given up or been discouraged. Thank You, Lord. Thank You for calling us to great purpose and then being committed to us to help us get there and arrive at those times in our lives when we need to be our best with areas worked out because you have constantly been shaping us and mold us. And thank you for working on us in spite of our imperfections. We pray, Father, for our church that you would encourage us today in this season. We need you, God, to lift us up in all this craziness that we're dealing with. Thank you for your incredible grace in this story in Scripture to remind us of your commitment to us and your love for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You be blessed. Have a great day.